Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You all know this show. This is where I sit down with amazing humans and I do everything I can to unpack their very important brains with the goal of helping you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today is a numerous, multi New York Times best selling author, longtime contributor to Esquire, to the New York Times, Washington Post, and many other things. And we're here to talk about his new project called Thanks a Thousand. My guest is the one and only AJ Jacobs. I won't say thanks a thousand because it's a little too on the nose, but thank you. I'm a big fan of the show and of your work, so I'm honored to be here. AJ, thank you. And I, a fan of you, um, the time where I was completely, I was aware of your work for a long time, but the time where I was completely floored by your work was at the World Domination Summit, uh, which I is- I love that. Yeah, That's it's a great conference. It's an amazing conference thrown by our mutual friend, Chris Gillibo. Uh, Chris has also been a guest in the show before, amazing human. But uh, so, uh, of course, you are extremely prolific as a writer, numerous New York Times bestsellers. I was completely blown away by your presence on stage as a speaker. You had the audience, I don't know, it was like a 50 minute talk or something <laughs> like that. And you had, a, a li I was like crying, laughing, oh, sitting on the so... front of my chair, just. Uh, and you got a raving stand-up, um, what is that called? Standing ovation I am with like 5,000 well, people. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, I went into writing because I'm not very good at public presentations. And that tells you how good of a writer he is then. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened was I had to become good. And um, yeah, I basically forced myself to do speaking at any opportunity, you know? Wow. And, uh, and I just, I, I got a little, I don't think I'm, I'm smooth or, or the best, but I got a lot better. And part of the big turn was that I started to enjoy it. Like I faked enjoying it for so long that I actually became, uh, I, I, and I now, I like it better than writing. Like I would rather give a speech than sit alone. Cause sitting alone in yeah. a room is tough, you know, sure. that's why, you know, there's, you see, look back at all these writers in history, and a lot of them are depressed. And I don't think it's a coincidence. You're in a room alone, yep. and it's uh, it's not easy. So I've come around. I've made a 180, and now I hate writing, and I love speaking. <laughs> so I'm in the wrong business. I don't know what to well, do. But you're you're then you're in the right place today. Okay, we're, good. We're, yes. we're, we're going to talk here, and um, you, you, you're familiar with the show. So we'll, I have a little narrative arc that I want to follow, but. Please, if there's anything you want to share, because you're hilarious, brilliant, and just grab the mic and we can run in any direction that you want to. Um, Excellent. But we will start out, if we can, uh, with, uh, I think it was one of the things that you covered in your talk, which is one of the first writings that I really delved into. I was, just a small backstory. Uh, I'm in New York with you right now, and on Sunday, it's, it's Tuesday right now, and on Sunday, um, I was sitting at our family cabin on Camano Island, an hour north of Seattle, looked over to the books. Uh, we share this cabin with my parents. I looked over in the bookshelf, and there's only like 12 or 15 books, a lot of just um, stuff that my mother and father would just pull off the, like the, ch the checkout stand just to read while they're at the cabin, and a couple of just classics, and I looked right dead center in the middle is uh, A Year of Living Biblically. I'm honored to be at one of 12 or 15, that's big. <laughs> and I'm like, and my parents, we were overlapping with them because we were on our way here to New York and my parents were coming up to say, and I was like, who, wait, how, how do you guys have this book? Oh, that was theirs, not that yours. That was theirs, oh, not mine. even better. And I was like, wait, and my dad just chimes in, he's like, oh my God, hilarious. <laughs> and so I'll just, that, that's my entree into your living biblically. You opened with some really funny lines at the World Domination Summit, but the short version is you tried to live in accordance with the Bible, literally. As literally as possible, exactly. For a year. Now, you come from, I'm, I'm more of a secular human, I think you come from a secular family, so this was not a like, right. you were getting deep into your faith, this was like, I'm gonna try and do this thing. Well, it was exactly like you said, I grew up with no religion, I was, um, as I say in the book, I'm, I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. No <laughs> offense to the Olive Garden. 
But I wanted, I had a, a kid uh, and I wanted to know, is there anything I'm missing? What, why does half the world believe in religion? Uh, you know, so I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna become the ultimate fundamentalist and see what's the good, what, how it affects my life in good, good way and how it affects my life in a not so good way. And so I did, I followed all the rules and you know, not just the famous ones. I did the famous ones like the Ten Commandments, love your neighbor. Uh, but I also wanted to try the ones that don't get a lot of attention. The Bible says you cannot shave the corners of your beard. I didn't know where the corners were, so I just let the whole thing grow, and I looked like Ted Kaczynski there. <laughs> so had, uh, the Bible says that you should stone adulterers, so I figured I should tr at least try, and I was. I was able to stone one adulterer uh, using very small stones, like pebbles, so I didn't, I didn't hurt him uh, too much. But the idea was, yeah, test it all out without picking and choosing and see what works and what doesn't. Take away? Well, there were a lot of takeaways. Uh, I would say one takeaway was don't follow the Bible literally. <laughs> was there, like, you had to wear certain clothes too, right? Oh, yeah. Threads made of... Yeah, no mixed fibers. So like polycotton blends are out. They are an abominate. God hates polycotton blends. <laughs> so you so, can wear the shirt that you're wearing today. Of course that's not. That's true. This it, is, I think, a poly, blend, right? but it's nice. Uh, so yeah, I'm not living by it. So yeah, don't follow the Bible literally. Don't say that homosexuality is a sin just because... The Bible has a passage that, that might say that. Um, but on the good side, there were a lot of positive takeaways as well. Uh, one of them is gratitude, which I won't talk about now. Yep. But another was, um, another was what we were just talking about, how the whole fake it till you make it, fake it till you feel it, yep. was, was really baked into the Bible. Because I would, you know, I had to try to not to covet or lie or gossip and I live in New York City and work as a journalist. So that's like, that's like <laughs> don't 70%. Work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't work. <laughs> Only do 30% of your job for the next year. Oh. Um, but the way I did it was I pretended to, I acted as if I were a better person than I was. Uh, so I would like force myself to visit a friend in the hospital, even though I hated going. But your brain sees, you trick your brain. You see you're in a hospital visiting a friend. Oh. I must be kind of compassionate, and you eventually become a little more compassionate. You know, I'm still an incredibly selfish person, like I think most people are, but I'm better. I'm like 40% better than I was, and, uh, and it's partly because of that, of the following these rules, forcing yourself to be a good person even when you don't feel it. What, I mean, just as a project, you were a successful writer, you've, you've had many New York Times bestsellers. What compelled you to put yourself on that journey? We've had, we have mutual friends and people who've been on the show who are sort of, they consider their some, themselves lab rats or experimenters and they're you know, trying the new diet fad or experimenting with hallucinogenics or, but you decide to give up a year of your life and walk around in cotton and only work 30% of your job. Like what, <laughs> what, what was, like, how, how did you decide? Well, I do love, like our mutual friends, I love the self-experimentation. Yeah. I really think it's a, the best way to improve yourself. And I feel I need a lot of improvement. So I've done various parts of my life. You know, I tried to be the healthiest person alive. I tried to ingest all the information in the world by reading the Encyclopedia Britannica from A to Z. Uh, when it still existed, uh, and and this was sort of an area of my life that I I had no, um, I, I was I was just completely ignorant, and I, I you know there's a lot of people who say write what you know, which I think is good in a sense, but I didn't know anything, so I'm like <laughs> if I'm going to write what I know, I'm going to have to live it, uh, and I don't I think that's part of it. I did not grow up, uh, you know I. I was either, it was a blessing and a curse. I, I had a pretty uneventful childhood. My parents were not spies or, you know, <laughs> carnies or, <laughs> you know, drug addicts. They were just nice uh, middle-class people who I love. But uh, if I were going to write that as a book, that would not. That would sell like four copies. <laughs> so I try, I try to put myself in extraordinary situations and see what I learn and then write about that. So let's reference those two, the, the two things you just noted. One, 
uh, Life is a Know-It-All. Right. That was one of my first books. Which is the re reading the encyclopedias. I read a from A to Z, uh, from A-ak, which is the first word, a type of uh, ancient Korean music, all the way to Zivich, which is Z-Y-W-I-E-C, which is a, uh, not to ruin, don't want to spoilers, but uh, <laughs> it's a town in Poland. And I tried to learn everything I could, and it was fascinating. It was uh, hard, especially for my family, because... Uh, I, my wife started penalizing me one dollar for every irrelevant fact I inserted into conversations. <laughs> and then you, your advance at the end of it all it was in her pocket, right? There you go. Exactly. <laughs> she made a lot of money. I did not. But, um, I mean, again, there were, aside from the craziness, like, you know, the, the, the weird knowledge I learned, like, you know, opossums have 13 nipples, that kind of thing, which unfortunately is still stuck in my brain. One of the big takeaways was was again a, a sense of gratitude because when you read about all of history, yeah. you see that the good old days were not good. Yeah. So this sense of nostalgia, this make America great again, it, like the past was not a nice place. Yeah. And Steven Pinker wrote a wonderful book about it. I don't know if you've seen that one. Yeah, I haven't, but. Enlightenment now. Um, and, you know, I think Pinker's work is amazing. But, I'm a yeah. big fan. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the idea is, you know, the lives were incredibly short and, uh, and it was, uh, you know, dangerous. It was smelly, you know. Yeah. Imagine like manure literally piled up like to your shoulders on the sides of streets, uh, you know. And uh, it, was, it was racist, homophobic, the whole thing. Um, I mean, when I get depressed, which, which happens... A good amount of time I try to fight it with my mindset and one of my mantras is surgery without anesthesia like until a hundred years ago that's what you would have to do surgery without anesthesia and you know I've had surgery a couple of times and it's not pleasant but imagine it without <laughs> anesthesia and it's like yes we have a lot of challenges and let's let's attack them and let's try to solve problems but let's not just say, oh, we should go back to the past and life has gone downhill. No, we should be optimistic. We should realize we have solved some amazing problems as yeah. a species. And just, I think, for one layer of context that I'll throw in there to, I guess, chime in is, I think it's the safest, orders of magnitude safer even, you know, 50 years, orders of magnitude more safe than it was even 50 years ago. Um, and there's way less violent crime now, but it's the reporting of violent crime that's up, you know, 11,000% totally. or something exactly. like that. So, and when you go on social media, you just see bad news all day long. Like, right. you used to be able to live your life and then read uh, about how horrible the world is at the end right. of the day. Right. Now it's like all day long. So I actually do try not to, I try to ingest my news at the end of the day so I can get depressed and fall asleep. <laughs> But don't let it ruin your day because it's very warped. You know, you could, you could do it. every day. I was just listening to some scientists say every day the main headline in the New York Times could have been 30,000 people to yesterday were lifted out of extreme poverty because the, the progress we've made in fighting extreme poverty is just one of the most underreported and amazing things in the world. Um, so yeah, the media, even though I'm a part of it, I'm very skeptical of it. I think that's a really interesting dynamic. I don't want to, I got a, a plan to go a slightly different direction, but I think it's good to put a pin in that, which is just a reminder that all of the news that you read is, um, there's a machine behind it not too different from the military industrial complex. It's a, the ad complex. Ryan Holiday has written a lot about yes. it. Like, um, that sensational news is what gets clipped on and viewed, so there's an extreme increase in that. It's just that's not reality. Just to be clear, yeah, it's the exactly. safest, most joyful, um, and flourishing time in human history. I doesn't love doesn't feel like it sometimes, but that's I think what is so intriguing about your work is you've got this sort of contrarian viewpoint, um, and you do it with grace and humor, and um, which is going to segue me into your current book here, oh, which is Thanks a Thousand. Um, I'm going to give a short, short blurb, and then you can fill in the blanks and tell me where I blew it. But sure, um, I've got a bunch of dog ears here, uh, things I'd like to talk to you about. But in short, this is uh, a book about gratitude, where AJ chases 
uh, the thread of everyone who has had a hand in producing his morning coffee. And um, you were challenged by one of your children, I think, to, um, to thank all these people. You were saying thanks at the table. I, I, I think the book said something like, the table, you're like, oh, thanks for the person who gets my morning coffee. And your kid said something like, Dad, they can't hear you. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> well, exactly. Just to <laughs> elaborate on that, I, you know, I, I knew that gratitude is incredibly important, especially in these stressful times. Yep. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's good for your health, it's good for your sleep, it's good for your motivation to work and to change the world. But, uh, and so I learned partly in the Bible, you know, to say these prayers of thanksgiving. But I'm an agnostic, so saying prayers to thanksgiving to God is a little weird for me. So instead, I would say before a meal, I would be you know, thanks to the guy who grew the tomatoes and the guy who drove the truck or the woman who sold it to me at the store. And my son, as you said, he's like 11, and he's like, you know, Dad, they can't hear you. So if you really want to commit, you should go and thank them in person. And I was like, that's a good idea. That's my next book. <laughs> thank you. I owe you uh, 10% or whatever. Uh, but so that's what I did. I went and I tried to thank the hundreds of people that go into making my cup of coffee that I totally take for granted. And uh, so not just the farmer who grew the beans, I did go there and thank them, but uh, you know, the person who designed the coffee cup lid, and I couldn't believe the thought and passion that went into that. The people who did the logo, the, uh, uh, the guy who drove the truck, the guy who painted the lines in the highway so the truck didn't get in an accident. And you realize there are thousands of people there. And, and there are hundreds of things that go right every day uh, that we totally take for granted, and we focus on the three or four that go wrong, and that can be a debilitating way to go through life and really hurt your productivity and just your mood. Allow me to read for just a second. Oh, thank you. Dear Mr. Darren Woods, comma, CEO of Exxon, <laughs> thank you for, for providing the gasoline that fuels the trucks that gets my coffee to me. I knew uh, sorry, I know you and your employees work very hard. I love coffee. I hope to drink it for a long time. I hope that climate change caused by our world's over-reliance on fossil fuels doesn't ravage the planet and make it impossible to have coffee farms in the future. I hope we embrace alternative energies more aggressively than we are doing now. Anyways, to reiterate, thank you for helping me get my coffee. It is delicious. <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, as I say, that's the most passive-aggressive thank you note in history. <laughs> Um, and that came about because I realized, you know, there are all these hardworking people, but, you know, not all of the corporations who help you get your food to your table or your t-shirt, they're not always, you know, looking out for the, the good of the world. They're looking out for profits their, and for shareholders. Profit. Yeah. Right. So my idea was I still want to thank them because they did help make my coffee, but maybe while thanking them, do a little <laughs> dig and say, can we move in a different direction so that a little more uh, looking to the future. I, I read that knowing that there would be a nice explication around it, but I think the point uh, of thanking a thousand people who provide your coffee, and you actually cite them. I do, I have a name list in the of back a thousand people, yeah. Um, and so this is the kind of, this is the kind of both joy, um, humor, creativity, art that, AJ, I think you do better than anyone who's writing today, which is just this beautiful alchemy. It feels to me a lot like life. It's confusing and abstract, and anytime you look very closely at something, you can either be wildly excited or deeply, deeply upset. Um, and what you've reminded us here is that, that uh, through it all, gratitude is probably, you, you, you talk about the, benefit, the health benefits at the right. beginning. Um, but why, again, I, I, sort of like there, there are people at home watching and listening saying, of all of the things for AJ to write about, like, why this? Was it, is it a personal journey? Is it a journey to help culture be more thankful? Like, what is, you know, what's your end goal? I think that both. I think that, you know, I was uh, in an incredibly stressful place, like much of the country, not happy with what's happening in, in politics. And, uh, and so, but, the, but I realized, you know, that's not productive just to stew and to, uh, 
you know, ruminate and, uh, you know, let me try to flip the script, as you said before the show, flip the script and realize that uh, you can make a difference and you can make, you can, you know, this is essentially a way to, a, sort of a guide to happiness, you know, how to live a more grateful life. And I really do believe happiness, I mean, gratitude is one of the secret ingredients, if not the secret, you know, there's a Benedictine monk with a phrase that I love. He says, happiness does not lead to gratitude. Gratitude leads to happiness. And I love that. So my idea was by actually going out there, forcing myself to thank a thousand people, it would change my attitude and life, which it did. Um, and it was, you know, it was a little weird because I would cold call these people or I would show up and I would, you know, some of them were like, you know, what are you trying to sell? Like, is this yeah. a pyramid scheme? What it, but some of them, I remember calling the woman who provided the pest control for the warehouse where my coffee is stored and I called her up and I said, this may sound a little weird, but I want to thank you for keeping the bugs out of my coffee. And she's like, that does sound weird. <laughs> but she also <laughs> said, you know, no one ever thanks us. And it really, you know, you made my day. And that made my day. And uh, so I think that a large part of it is just realizing, as you said right before the show, you know, we only go around once. Let's, you know, instead of stewing and being negative and not getting anything accomplished except for complaining, like this is a way to access that. And also, it, it, you know, some people are like, are worried that gratitude will lead to complacency. If like everyone's so grateful, then they won't want to change anything. But the studies show just the opposite. The more grateful you are, the more you want to help others. And I saw this on a very little small scale, like, you know, realizing how much goes into my water, uh, which is 98% of coffee is water. Realizing how much goes in made me so grateful that I can turn on a tap and get water. So I, you know, I got involved. Unlike more than a billion people on the planet who don't have access. Exactly. To what, like your guest. Yeah, uh, Scott Harrison. Scott Harrison. Yeah. So yeah, getting involved in a, a charity that helps provide water. Um, and uh, yeah, I know a lot of your, uh, a lot of your uh, listeners are entrepreneurs. Yeah. So it's like also, I'm an entrepreneur as a writer. You know, I'm basically a, a solo business. But uh, so the idea of being grateful to my customers is incredibly motivating. And as part of this, uh, I am actually going to write a thousand thank you notes to my readers by hand. Uh, so uh, I may, you know, there's the, the risk of, what's it called? Carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> but, by hand. But I feel that, you know, these people have put some time in and, uh, how will you and find it's the people? such a one way. So this is like when the book drops, they're going to buy the book and then you're going yeah. to find a thousand people. If you go to my them. website, ajjacobs.com uh, slash thanks and just fill out a form with your name and your address, physical address and anything you want to say. Like if you want me to comment on, you know, that you're graduating uh, college or you love the Chicago Bears or whatever, I'm going to actually write a thank you note to you. Because it's such a one-way, a lot of times it's such a one-way thing, being an author. I want to thank people. Like, you know, it's such a gift that people have bought or, or borrowed. I don't need them to buy uh, and read the book. That is an incredible approach to their project. By hand. That thousand, is it. By thousand. hand. Um, I, I take on, I, I write, uh, not every week, but some weeks I try and write 10 postcards oh. to Creative Live customers who have um, I, I choose them at random um, or they are chosen idea. for me and it's just a great way for me to stay close to the people that we make classes and content have for. you gotten feedback from that yeah a lot of like photographs on Instagram of the of the oh, and so it's nice, nice to, it's nice to um, establish a, a dialogue with someone who's you know sometimes a thousand miles away or whatever right. um, well, well I read I mean there there's a book called Appreciation Marketing, which is all about how gratitude, you should be grateful to your customers. And they have all these examples of like Mary Kay from Mary Kay Cosmetics did what you did. Yeah. Three, three thank you notes a day to people. 
Um, there's another book by the founder of a department store. I think it's Kohl's. It's called Hug Your Customers, which I actually don't recommend in this <laughs> post Harvey Weinstein world. Yep. Like hug them metaphorically. Yeah. But uh, but I approve of the general idea. Like you, you know you got to appreciate your customers, and I think that appreciation when it's expressed which is is great for business. There's. Uh, I also get to, every once in a while, we'll sit down with our um, student support team and respond to support tickets. And it's just so insightful that when people are frustrated, they're frustrated not because, well, you can't always tell why they're frustrated, but that how, how the smallest thing, saying, I'm sorry, mm -hmm, if your right. experience didn't go well, we should have done a better job just the smallest genera generous um, act toward them yeah. can sometimes completely flip the interaction. That's interesting. So, I mean, just like literally saying, I'm so sorry. Right. And you it, do that with email? Yeah, or yeah. yeah. In a, in a, there's a, you know, a, a back end to support tickets if someone has a problem with Creative right. Live or whatever. Um, so I think it's, it's a good way, a, a, to stay humble, B, to stay close to customers, and C, to be able to, like, actually help people because right. a lot of these a lot of times um, someone's complaints are really a, a cry for help I know that's how it is when I'm frustrated or upset or angry I'm likely to yell at another driver sitting here in Manhattan um, if they're not behaving like I think they should behave that's really about me it has, no, <laughs> has nothing to do with them yeah um, uh, that's interesting I have a friend who, uh, who she's a journalist and writer and and you know, trolls on the internet are a very tricky thing, so I'm not saying this will work every time, but she says when she gets people trashing her on, the, on Twitter, that she'll often just write them a direct message or, or even heart, you know, like the, um, the comment, uh, and she's been able to turn around a lot of trolls. If you just directly reach out to them and say, yeah. I'm sorry you feel that way, like they get... Not everyone, I'm sure there are, there are some <laughs> There are trolls who are thin as, thicker than that, I'm sure. Yeah, but, exactly. Um, so, gratitude, the practicality, the health benefits. All, is there anything else you, you'd like to say about your personal journey uh, on the road to gratitude? Well, I would say one thing that has really helped is this idea of savoring. Um, and I did a, which is tied into gratitude. I, one of the books I did, uh, a few years ago was called Drop Dead Healthy, where I tried to be the healthiest person alive. And one of the people I interviewed was this guy who was, uh, he believes in calorie restriction, you know that, where you don't, like you eat the minimum amount and you live a long time. And you know, I have my issues with that. Yeah, you may live a long time, but it's gonna be <laughs> like, why live if you can't have an occasional pancake? <laughs> so, but he, he had me do this exercise called savoring meditation, where we took a blueberry and put it in our mouth and literally spent 15 minutes, like, you know, you know, tasting the texture and the sweetness and the acidity. And it was bananas. It was like a crazy, you know, you don't really want to do 15 minutes on a blueberry. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, you know, the whole time I was like, oh, let me get some, you know, yodels. And I want, this is driving me crazy. But that said, I do love the idea behind it, this, that we do just wolf down our food and we wolf down experiences and taking a moment to stretch out, you know, I don't recommend 15 minutes, but five seconds letting your coffee sit on your tongue, letting your food sit on your tongue, uh, and just thinking about it and savoring it and collecting these moments. And it occurs to me, it's actually kind of like photography uh, because often I try to see my life as I, I, like I'm a curator of great moments uh, and, and focusing on those because otherwise you just, your life whizzes by and you, uh, you're, you know, you're not focused on anything, you, you, and uh, and this idea of savoring and collecting moments, almost like you're a photographer without a cam. You don't need yeah. a camera to be a photographer, but really just focus on a moment. The the spirit, the connection with that moment, and the people, and the, do you store those up here then? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually started a file, and just in the last six months, which I love. 
which I call one thing. And anytime I read a book, I have a conversation, uh, I go somewhere, I, I try to take one thing that I learned or that was uh, wonderful about it and write that down. And I occasionally go back and look at my file of one thing because I, if I didn't do that, if I don't do that, yeah. like I don't remember anything. So one thing is much better than zero. You know, I'm never going to remember seven things from a great book I read, but the one thing is uh, is a beautiful. All right, this is I think a, a fantastic transition from the sort of ethereal conceptual realm of your work in general. Thanks a thousand as the book because I'd like to now get into this very practical. Like oh, yeah. that is a very practical exercise, right? You have a file and you write down one thing. Uh, I wanna know like, what are some of your, your habits around this kind of stuff? Because that's for the folks at home sure. watching, listening, like we, we all want like actionable stuff that we yeah. can not just like, oh my gosh, AJ Jacobs is so fun and funny and I can't believe he, you know, submitted an entire year of his life to live in a th thread that were only from one fiber and he didn't shave the corners of his beard, that's awesome. <laughs> but let's go practical. Yeah, okay. so, I've got a bunch. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, let me just start with yeah. a quick practical gratitude one, which is just making sure when something goes right, when you're in a line that moves quickly at the drugstore, make a mental note of that because we are so apt to remember the times when the line was an hour and a half long because that's what sticks. You know, negative stick. So really try to fight that bias and remember every time, you know, every time you go to an airport and the gate is right there as opposed to having to walk, you know, four miles past the, the yogurt shop. So that I do. For one thing I find very helpful is, uh, you know, as a writer, I'm basically, my lifeblood is ideas and I think entrepreneurs in general. So I will uh, a lot. I'm, you know, someone used the phrase, it's a little cheesy, make a, make a um, appointment with your creative side. So really just but slotting out 15 minutes a day from 3 to 3.15, I'm not going to turn off all electronics and just brainstorm. Realizing that 95% of your ideas are going to suck because that's the way it works. You know, you, well, Picasso had 95% of his ideas suck. So, um, but... That's what I try to do. I brainstorm and maybe I'll have a topic like new book ideas. Maybe it'll be like, you know, brainstorm about gratitude. Maybe it'll just be random like, uh, you know, take like a snowman and what can I do with that? How can I, uh, I could make a snow woman. I could make a snow transgender person. I could make, I could replace the pipe with a, a veep. Uh, you know, you can do. <laughs> and just that act. James Altucher talks, and I talk about this a lot, the act of, of Play, playing yeah. and being creative, that key, you know, the mind, brain really is a muscle. Yeah. Uh, I believe that analogy is correct. And so just having that muscle be strong, that helps you solve problems in any part of your life. Like, you know, you get a flat tire and you'll be better able to solve it. You, you have a problem at business, you'll be able to solve it. So that's one thing I love to do. Um, another actionable thing was uh, is something that you reminded me of before the show you were telling me about how as a young athlete you taught you were taught about visualization yeah and uh and i was not an athlete but i once interviewed george clooney for esquire magazine wow uh who was a delight and uh but one of his tips to me which i always remember he was a a college baseball player and his, when he got up to the plate, he would say to himself, he wouldn't say, uh, uh, am I going to hit a home run? He wouldn't say, uh, I'm going to hit a home run. He would say, I'm going to hit a home run over the left field fence. Like he would be very specific and have this delusional optimism. Because I do believe delusional optimism is an incredibly powerful tool. And I've you know, I've used it so many times, this pretending you have confidence whether or not you do. Like when I was writing my book about health, I would wake up in the morning like filled with despair uh, because it's such a big topic. I'm like, when am I ever- Overwhelmed. You know, I was overwhelmed. 
but I would, I would force myself to have this delusional optimism and I would call the publisher and say, all right, so when the book comes out and we have the big publishing party, let's serve kale martinis. Let's have like healthy uh, drinks. And, and by doing that, that action of delusional optimism, again, caught my brain up and, uh, and made me more optimistic and able to actually finish. So, so yeah, I'm with you on this idea of visualization. And, uh, and just, you know, delusional optimism has its, has its limit. You gotta be careful, because you don't wanna be like, you know, delusional optimism, I think, if you've never been in politics and know nothing about it, but decide you could be a great president, like that has caused some problems, <laughs> as we can see. Nice. But if you use well, it for good, if you use it for good and you use it for your own business and making yourself a better person, it's such a powerful tool. So you've got 15 minutes of creativity. You've got a gratitude practice of small moments day to day when you're thinking when the line moves fast. Right. Um, give me a couple other habits that, that you feel like in your wildly creative world have helped you be happier, healthier, um, and better at what you want to do with life. Uh, well, one, uh, one would be writer's block, which uh, you know, I suffer from, as does everyone. And, and it's in the same line. Often I'll just force myself to start typing and it could be about any, I know that those first 20 minutes of writing are gonna be crap. Uh, and I could write about any, you know, I could write about the pigeons on my ledge and how their heads are bopping. But just the action of moving my fingers gives me momentum. And, and, and eventually I start writing something that's semi-coherent. So I would say, yeah, just dive in knowing, being aware that the first 20 minutes, uh, half an hour, an hour may be terrible. Um, well, I, when my health book, one of the things I found incredibly powerful was um, this idea, a Yale professor came up with it, uh, this idea of egonomics, that we have two selves. We've got the present self and the future self. And the present self, you know, wants to sit on the couch and eat Cheetos. The future self wants to be alive. The future self, like, wants that present self to act in a way that uh, will keep them around. Yeah, make the future healthy, possible. yeah, possible. Yeah. Yeah. Possible uh, at first and then maybe great as a secondary character. Exactly. Got it. So uh, this guy has done studies to show that the more you think about your future self, the, the better decisions you make in the present. So, um, so I actually took this as literally as I could. So I, and I don't recommend you have to do this, but uh, I, I took a photo of myself and there are all these app, there are a couple of apps online where you can age the photo. So I aged myself to like a 78 year old and I put it up on my, above my desk. So I've got like the 80 year old me looking down on me and saying, you know, when I, when I just, you know, want to uh, read TMZ and not do any, uh, you know, instead of going for a walk or on from my treadmill, that, uh, that I look up and I try to treat that older version of me like I would treat a family member or a friend. I want to like have respect for him. Yeah. So, and that really does motivate me to uh, act in a better way. Um, and I do, one of the things I did for the health book was I wrote it while walking on a treadmill. So I still, that is one of the things I've kept from the health book. I still wow. write on a treadmill. How did I not know that? Is that a feature that you advertised about the book? I have talked wow. about it. And uh, wow. you know, I also get motivated. This works for some people, but not for others. The, the peer pressure and the, the, the idea of potential humiliation. So <laughs> like, if I don't get 10,000 steps a day and ha I have all these friends who I, I, accountability buddies. Accountability buddies. I do think those work uh, for me, not for everyone. How do you, what's the specifics? How do you actually employ that tactic? Uh, well, for a you while. You track it in the walking app. In the I iPhone. actually have moved on to the, just the iPhone app, yep, yep. which I love. Yep. And, uh, but for a while I was using Fitbit and they have an online community where you can, so I would have writer friends who would mock me if I didn't get to 10,000 and then I would do the same to them. 
And yeah, fear of humiliation can be a very good, <laughs> good motivator. I am a big fan. And yeah, it doesn't have to be walking. It could be anything, losing weight, getting the proposal out. Um, and uh, uh, well, this one is, I actually, I have a big project I want to do next, uh, but it is taking me longer than I want it. So I have done the um, breaking down into very small parts, uh, I, mini goals. You know, okay. the mini goals, because I really believe in mini goals. Like can even, you just, can, is it a project that you can't speak of, or can you? No, I can tell. Like yeah. I just want to do something about truth and fake news and how we can rescue it, but I haven't figured it out exactly. So, my mini goals are, you know, every day I'm going to come up with ten ideas of how to attack this. Um, you know, by uh, a month from now, I'm going to have written five pages a day for seven days and have 30, you know, so even if it's like, I sometimes do such many goals that they seem ridiculous, like I am going to get out of this chair. I don't have to go on my treadmill, but I'm just, my goal is to get out of this chair. And once you get out of the chair, you're like, well, I'm out of the chair. I might as well. That wasn't such a big deal. Walk toward the treadmill. I don't have to go on it. I can walk toward it. I find that mini goals are a very effective way to tackle because you just can't, when I think of like writing a book, I'm just overwhelmed still. I think of it, I try to think of it, I'm not going to write a book, I'm going to write like 15 um, chapter, 15 essays and then weave them together. Uh, and that's, that's much less intimidating. So shifting gears. You're cousins with Oprah and, <laughs> and with Bill Clinton. So how is that? And with you. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, that was my previous book before this Thanks a Thousand was I got a crazy email uh, like four years ago from a guy who said, you don't know me, but I'm your 12th cousin. And I thought, as most people would, that he was going to ask me to wire $10,000 to Nigeria. <laughs> but... Uh, it turned out he was legitimate, and he's part of this fascinating group of scientists and researchers who are trying to build the world family tree, like actually connect everyone on Earth. Which is an amazing mission. It's a mission. crazy yeah. mission, and I got swept away with it. Um, and it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but for everyone on Earth. We are all related, and you can find out with DNA testing. You can also find out with these sort of massive online family trees that are like the Wikipedia family trees. So you can, like with uh, Obama, Obama is my fifth great aunt's husband's brother's wife's seventh great nephew. That is the actual line. And I love that. And you know, I reached out to him, invited him to Thanksgiving, haven't heard back. Uh, <laughs> but the idea of this project was to show in this time of tribalism and every us versus them, that it is kind of ridiculous. We really are so closely related, shared over 99.5% of our DNA. And, and we are literally a family. And, uh, and the studies have shown that when you really see this concretely, it does affect your, they did a study on Palestinians and Israelis. And when they told them how closely they were related, they treated each other with more kindness. Um, and I don't think it's the panacea. You know, I've, I have sons and I see how they wrestle and it's not pretty. So not family doesn't always get along. But uh, the studies show that family gets along better than total strangers. And, uh, and, and so, so your mission with the book was to show that we're all, we should employ kindness because we're all family. Right. And the hope was we would become just a little bit kinder. But I will say, since I know a lot of your audience is entrepreneurs, it was also incredibly practically useful because it's like LinkedIn on steroids because I would, like I wanted to get publicity for this book so I would look up a reporter at the New York Times or a producer at the Today, in the Today Show and I would figure out how we're related and I would email them and say, you know, this may sound a little weird but um, I'm your cousin and uh, I have a new book coming out Here's how we're cousins. You know, you're my 12th cousin, three times removed. And 20% you know, of the time, they were like, all right, you know, 
well, let's get a uh, restraining order against this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was surprisingly effective uh, because they're like, oh, this is a weird connection. Like any connection, any connection, we're, as humans, we are just such, uh, you're so wired to uh, respond. We're social animals. We're social we, animals. We literally, a, a child left alone without contact will not survive. There you we're, go. We're, we are wired for this. And when you're, like the, con the concept of being able to be connected in any way, I think that's part of what, you know, what we're in people's ears right now because they want to hear stories about other people who are, whose lives are enough like theirs that they can relate and enough different that they can aspire. Right. I think this is a very simple human thing and by acknowledging it, it just, it's sort of like a, a catapult. That's why for me, lifelong learning is such an important part of this. And the, one of the ways that I learn is through podcasts or creative live or reading or consuming the work that you put out, say, or any other guests. Give me some specific examples. I think the one, the promotion of your book is really funny. So were there any that actually you, did you land on the Today Show because of Oh the, yeah, I was on, um, I was on, it wasn't, I was on Good Morning America. So not the Today Show, but I also, for the book, I wanted to interview some sort of famous families. And so I reached out to George H.W. Bush, it's the elder Bush, because uh, I figured he's a patriarch of like this uh, famous American family. I'm a Democrat, but still, he's an interesting guy. And, uh, and his chief of staff, he still has chief of staff, said, you know, the president's not doing any interviews now. And I said, totally understand, but just so he knows, we are cousins. We are seventh cousins, three times removed through this and this. And she's like, huh, well, let me check and see what she says about that. And she actually, it worked. I couldn't believe it. It was so crazy. And I flew down to Houston and I got to talk to him. And uh, he had some wonderful wisdom, uh, as did his late wife, about, uh, about family. And just to add on what the wisdom, one of the best things that I still think about is um, that in a relationship that with your spouse or, or even, yeah, with friends, but mostly with your spouse or partner, you should try to put in 75% because you always underestimate what you, the other person is putting in and overestimate what you're putting in. So, uh, you know, account for that error, account for that bias, and put in 75%. And you know, I don't do that, but I try to put in like 55% <laughs> <laughs> and hope for the best. <laughs> but I think she's right. You know, we totally don't realize what others do, which is part of the whole point of Thanks a Thousand. You know, we just take for granted all these hundreds of things that other people do. On a daily basis to make our lives possible to make us be able to get from midtown to downtown for us to be able to um to do anything there's a whole huge chain of people right more 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 weird examples from the family tree uh what was the name of the project again I, I that know. was called the book is called it's all relative that's right and for the project i actually threw a family reunion that uh, called the Global Family Reunion. And I got 4,000 people in New York to come and we had the craziest collection. We had rabbis and priests and ministers and atheists on stage. Sister Sledge came and sang, we are family, uh, which was crazy. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, you had mentioned we first met at the World Domination Summit in Portland. Uh, and I spoke about this project there, and uh, the people there were so amazing because they got on board as volunteers. There's nothing in it for them. They just liked the idea and the vision. Um, so I would, you know, I guess one of the takeaways of that, thinking about it, is if you speak with passion and, and you're not... You know, I, I did not make money on that. I lost a little money on throwing the reunion, but I just wanted the, the idea to happen. So I think they sensed I wasn't in it as a money-making thing, and they got behind it, and they put so much work into throwing like 30, no, 50 local reunions all around the world, like in New Zealand and in 
Mexico. And I think that is a profound lesson, like this idea of Wikipedia. When I first heard about it, I'm like, well, why the hell would anyone do work for free? But if you have a mission that you think that this is going to make the world better, people will work for free. Money is not the only reason that motivates people, you know, especially now they want this greater purpose. So that was extraordinary. What a, I, you know, I'm very thankful to World Domination Summit for, for that. Spe speaking of greater purpose, what's yours? Well, I think, I try to think, uh, you know, I, I think I was incredibly selfish for the first 35, 40 years of my life. And now I'm 50 and I'm trying to make up for it. So I am, uh, I am trying to, everything I do, I try to decide, I think about it as four quadrants. Like, how will this uh, affect my current happiness? How will it affect my future happiness? That's two quadrants. Then, how will it affect my, uh, the world's, my family and the world's happiness and the family and the world's future happiness? So that's part of the reason why I, you know, I'm motivated to do something about fake news and truth is uh, I'm not sure it's going to be the book that makes the most money. I think I can find a more uh, baldly commercial uh, thing, but uh, I really, I, I, that is, I, I'm very involved in something called effective altruism, which is a fascinating movement, which is about how to do the most good. Oh yeah, yeah, too. I give them a plug. Yeah. Yeah. How to do the most good with the, if you have a thousand dollars, where should you put it to do the most good? So, so that's it. And the paradox is. No, talk about that for a second. Oh, okay, sure. I would love to. Um, but just paradoxically, okay. so it doesn't sound like I'm, you know, uh, I'm Gandhi. The paradox is I am, I am much happier helping other people. When I was focused on my own happiness exclusively, I was miserable. And I think I've been like, you know, stressed and miserable for most of my life. But when I flipped the script and was like, you know what, I'm going to try to help other people, um, that made me so much happier because it was such a weight off my shoulders. I'm like, you know what? I, I don't have to focus exclusively on my happiness, and if I, you know, I'm unhappy for a while, that's fine as long as I've got this greater purpose. So, so it's weird that being less selfish is actually a, a, a good strategy for being happier yourself, and it's a nice coincidence. You know, it didn't have to be that way, but yeah. that's the way our minds work. You know, they talk about this glow you get from helping other people. But yeah. Plug, yeah, I'll give a plug for... Effective altruism, I'm a big fan. They are... Um, they what is it, first of all? It's basically if Spock from Star Trek and Mother Teresa got together, which I know is unlikely <laughs> <laughs> for many reasons, but if they had a baby, that would be effective altruism. It's sort of how can we be as rationally compassionate as we can. And it's actually quite big in Silicon Valley. Um, it's got a, a wide range. It does appeal to sort of an Asperger's uh, 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 personality sometimes, because okay. like these guys who make millions and millions of dollars and they're like, what am I gonna do with it? And they're like, you know, must do good, must do good in most uh, efficient, rational fashion. So, <laughs> and I kind of feel that way too. Uh, but yeah, so instead of just giving willy-nilly to charities, how can you uh, find the ones that on a, a dollar basis have the highest return? And Give Well is a wonderful organization that finds the best charities that save the most lives, like um, uh, the Against Malaria Foundation, which provides nets for people in Africa, and on a per dollar basis, like the amount of lives in, in they fact, save. Yeah. Um, and I also like that they're thinking about the far future, because it's not just us, like, you know, we should be thinking about our 14th great grandkids. So they're obsessed with things like global climate, and weirdly they are and I still don't know how to process this, but the threat of AI 
is something that concerns them. And they, these people are, most of them are a lot smarter than me, so I know that I, uh, I should be concerned. I still can't get excited about it, but I just throw it out there that they think we should really be concerned about robots taking over the world. And then you support them in that cause by giving money through giving well? Yeah, you can do give well, but also just going to meetups and yeah. spreading the word. Uh, yeah, effectivealtruism.com. So you've talked about going to meetups, you've talked about writing thank you letters to people who buy your books, you've talked about um, putting your family and the world's happiness on the same... Um, trying yeah, to. Yeah, I, I try I to. don't, yeah, yeah. but I try. Um, but is there... Is this based in practicality or uh, radical optimism or like what, what's, what powers you? You talked about your first 35 years were selfish and now you're trying to give back, but like go on a little deeper than that. Like this is, this starts to feel like a, a life mission. There's a really clear thread here. What's driving it? Uh, well, I would say I think uh, that's a good question. I, I would say it's partly just the idea of realizing that focusing only on yourself is not a path to happiness and that being part of a community, uh, you know, we're wired as humans to be part of a community. And, uh, you know, I always saw myself as a solo, uh, you know, I'm just radical lone, lone individualist. Wolf. Yeah. yeah, lone wolf. But lone wolves are not very happy. Uh, so I, uh, that's what, that's what has, uh, motivated it. And yeah, you know, I, not to be cliche, but I have kids and I want to be around to see them and, uh, you know, do their first. Well, you're anything but cliche, so you don't, you don't have to, you don't <laughs> well, have to say you, that. Thanks. But I, so I have a, a hypothesis. Um, I talk about it in a fair number of shows, but I think it's important. And it's, it's called the other 50%. And I don't know if you're familiar with this idea of mine, but I'll, I'll give you a little breakdown. So yeah. it goes like this. Most people in the world think that as creators or entrepreneurs that the work that we do stands for itself. Mm. You put it out there in the world and if it's good, it finds success. And if it's not good, it doesn't find success. There's a very clear pattern of people in the show and in the world. If you know anything about sort of how, by and large, how um, creating consistent good results that's not the case, right? You have to let people know. You have to write to the morning show and tell them that you're their seventh cousin and could you help get me on the show kind of thing. Or you have to promote your work. So then if you buy into the fact that, okay, it's not just work that succeeds on the merit of the work, it's work plus outreach or, or creating and I'll say sharing it, making sure yeah. that the work gets out there. And then what I, I realized that looking at my own experience is that even if you share it and you don't have any friends or a community, it really falls flat because the concept is still in place where then the virtuous work succeeds because total strangers will, will pick it up and mm. elevate it, which is really not how the world works, right? Because right. how many times do you go looking for stuff that you have no connection to that when you find it, you tell everybody? Yeah. It's not a very popular experience that doesn't match my empirical experience. So my philosophy goes like this, that making great work and work that's fulfilling to you and sharing it is only half of the work that you have to do to make the things that you create and build successful. And the other half, as in 50%, you think, again, so we're, we're at like 25% of the work. Right. 25% sharing that work, which is a big hurdle for a lot of people. And now this other entire 50% block is actually building community. I love that. that so so call it the other 50%. And tell me, this is, this is I'm looking, and. Throw rocks at this because you're good at throwing rocks and stuff. You've, <laughs> you, you, you are nice at finding the sort of the counter culture angle or the counter angle, counter example to a lot of things in pop culture. Do you believe this? Would you, you, you've talked a lot about percentages here. Yeah. Like 40% of this is 25% of that. <laughs> How am I doing on I this buy it. I buy and, it. I don't know. I can't <laughs> speak to the percentages, but the general idea, absolutely. And I think one of the big changes in my career was. Uh, you know, you talk about creating the work is only 25%. And I hated the marketing part because I'm like, no, I'm a writer. I'm not going to try to get out there, build a community and like tell people about my work. That's not my job. What I did was I reframed it as a creative act. 
seeing the marketing as a creative act is incredibly powerful. So when I wrote the book about the Bible, instead of being annoyed that I had to try to pitch it to all these my magazines or radio shows, I'm like, how can I most creatively get the word out? So, uh, you know, the Bible talks about sex. Uh, so what about a, an article about sex advice from the Bible for Glamour magazine? And that's what I did. And there's, you know, music, talk about music in the Bible. So I wrote about that for a music website and like splitting it up. And that was so fun, just thinking of ways to do it. And I once interviewed the artist Christo and his wife. Christo, do you know? I had dinner right next to them, not too far. There's a little uh, sushi joint down the Lower East Side. And oh, really? I sat right next to him and his wife. No way. Yeah, this is the last time I was here. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. And for those who don't know, he's a, I would call him like installation artist. Or yeah. He installed, um, perhaps most famously, uh, the silk, um, Gosh, what were they? Just a, a big fabric installation in Central Park. I yeah, yeah. He had ten. They called it the gates. The he gates, had ten thousand right, yeah. gates that were sort of like orange poles with flowing orange fabric yeah. hanging from them. He wrapped the Reichstag in Berlin, the the building with cloth. So he does all these wacky things that are beautiful and they're yeah. so fun to look at. Um, but that one you mentioned, the one in Central Park, took him. It took him literally uh, twenty four years from the conception to when it actually came out. And I was like, how did you have the persistence to keep going? And he said the key was that he saw the bureaucracy as part of his creative process. So he, like doing the red tape was actually part of his art. And like going to the government and saying, you know, can I get a permit? Uh, you know, how will this affect the wildlife? And, doing all that nitty-gritty stuff instead of it's like god this is a pain in the ass i'm an artist revision it as re-envision it as this is part of my creative process and let's let's try to have fun with it and try so yeah reframing the dullest stuff that's seemingly dull because once you dive in nothing is really that dull like you know bureaucracy is actually quite interesting once you get into it so I love that. I love that, and I tried to take that into my own life. So I'm going to attempt to reduce a lot of the different concepts that we've been talking about to one thing, just for purposes of discussion here. I don't want to oversimplify them because that's dangerous. But ultimately what you're talking about in a lot of these things, whether it's gratitude or happiness or how you get yourself to get out of the chair and get to work or typing on a blank page, boils down to mindset. Oh yeah. So are all of these hacks that you have for getting in the right mindset, and if so, are there others that you haven't talked about, or are there ones, if I reframe the sort of the problem as a question of are you, like, do you have the right mindset, does that make you think about something different that you do on a daily basis? Like, how do you get yourself in the right mindset? to do the work that you want to do as a creator well, and entrepreneur? Well, that's a great question. And I think part of the secret for me is what we talked about, is acting your way into a new, way, new mindset. And there's a great quote, I wish I came up with it, the founder of Habitat for Humanity came up with it. And he said, it's easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than to think your way into a new way of acting. So, you know, if it were for Christo, just forcing yourself to engage with the city government and, and say like, you know, this is actually interesting. And the longer you do it, the more you can become convinced. Um, so like, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I always just focused on the art, but I forced myself to say, all right, I'm gonna try to turn this marketing and the business side into a creative act. And, and that's when, if you do it for a couple of weeks, that's when the mindset will catch up. But I think you're absolutely right. It's all about perspective. You know, you can see, you can, it's not just glass half full and half empty. Like you can see the glass as half empty and evaporating and filled with bacteria, or you could see it as half full and like just marvel at the fact that you could turn on a tap and get drinkable water which did not happen for 99% of human history and still is not available to billions of people. 
So it goes beyond just half full and half empty. It's like, you know, a radical, it's all about perspective. Radical perspective change. Right. Radical perspective change. So what's next for you? you, you you're constantly creating. I love, I mean, I don't know how many books, how many books are you in? Six? I mean, yeah, about six. Six. I mean, it depends. Some of them are like little books, but yeah, six real books. So um, obviously this, I'm talking about this like it's, um, it hasn't even come out yet. It's, it's due out in November. This was just an absolutely delightful read. Thanks a thousand. Um, and if you need more gratitude in your life, I'd recommend it to anyone. Uh, but what's next? So you got to promote this book, of course. And you right. What What is your hack for promoting this book? Is it the writing a thousand writing things? a thousand notes is a, is a big one. Yeah. And um, and will also, you, will you write I, them, who will you write them to? Just people who buy the book, or will you write them to journalists? Anyone who goes on the website okay. ajjacobscom slash thanks and gives me their info, I will write it. Um, and I'm actually, I haven't started marketing it yet, but I'm planning to do a little bit of the hack with marketing it. Like when I approach a reporter or a, a producer, I'll be like, you know, thank you for writing this, uh, for writing articles and for being a journalist in this time when we need journalists. Thanks to the lumberjacks who made the paper who, so that you could print it. Uh, you know, thanks to your parents for having you, and we'll see how that goes, whether that engages people. I, I've had been approached by, to turn this into a podcast, so uh, I may do that. Uh, and, you know, not coffee, choose some other item. Maybe it's one item per episode and thank people. Wow. Um, as I said, I want to do something about truth because I think it's endangered. Um, but, yeah, I am... Uh, I, as long as people keep uh, reading me, I will keep writing because I do, as I said, I don't love the writing, but I love the ideas, meeting people, researching, and talking about it. Well, you also, if, if you don't love writing, you're also an incredible speaker, and this is, uh, there's a little bit of a partnership here with TED. Right. The, the TED Talk, the, I sum this up in a TED Talk that will come out the same day the book is published, so on... November 13th. Got it. And you have a couple of other TED Talks. I do. I did one about what we, uh, we discussed, the year of living biblically. I did another one on the, um, the family. We're all one family. Uh, and yeah, I love them. You know, the, as you know, they don't pay anything. They're, so they're, yeah. And like, so stressful because I'm used to like looking at notes and just trying to speak for 18 minutes with no notes. So stressful. But <laughs> they are incredibly effective and I, I watch them and listen to them all the time myself. Uh, if there was some advice that you could give, I, I, you are, there is so much advice embedded in everything that you've just said, but I want to shift gears for a second and see if you can do us the favor of giving concrete advice, which I've heard you dodge this question a lot. <laughs> Did I? So I'm trying to pin you down sure. a little bit. Like there, again, there are people out there who are trying to decide if it's time to shift gears and chase their dreams, or people who are chasing their dreams and are struggling, like we all are, to make the things right. come true in the world that we want to see. Um, well, just lay it out there, like just some wrong one thing. Advice one phrase that I, I like, that I, I came up with that sort of resonates with me at least, is strategic chutzpah, you know, chutzpah, like just <laughs> being bold. And, um, and I remember when I read the encyclopedia, uh, there were so many examples of it. You know, people did not become successful sitting on the couch. You had to go out there and, and face massive rejection. Uh, the poet Langston Hughes, he was a busboy at a hotel in Washington, D.C., and he saw this famous poet uh, come out breakfast, and he took, Langston Hughes took his poems and like put them on the plate with the waffle, and it, it worked, you know. It, wa it won't always work, it probably won't work most of the time, but you got to put yourself out there. I had a, when I, a few years ago, I had a guy who went to my college, and he just wrote me out of the blue this very funny, engaging email uh, about how he wanted to be a writer, and uh, I was working on the Year of Living Biblically at the time, 
And the Bible actually in the Old Testament says that slavery is okay, which obviously is problematic. I did not <laughs> know how to deal with that. But I thought, you know, an intern is like, uh, that's the, the closest I could come. Uh, with, uh, so I offered him an internship, and he could be my biblical slave, and he was fantastic. He just did research, he baked biblical bread for me, and he went on to write a wonderful series. He's written two books, and he's now a New York Times col columnist, Kevin Roos. But he had the strategic chutzpah to write me a very engaging letter, not a form letter, a specific letter where he complimented what he liked about my work, and self-deprecating and funny. And if he had just gone through the regular channels, like the alumni office, I don't think I would have ever, it wouldn't have risen to my consciousness. Uh, so he practiced strategic chutzpah, and it really worked out for him. So I, that's what I recommend. I mean, there's a fine line between strategic chutzpah and, and stalking, so you got to be careful. But you really do have to just make, when, when I um, spoke to our mutual friend, Tim Ferriss, mm -hmm. he, he started out by going to conferences and approaching people and saying, I love what you do. Can I just take you to coffee for 10 minutes and ask you about it? And he was genuinely interested in what they do. And after a while, they would say, so what do you do? And that's when he was able to pitch himself. So uh, that kind of thing, strategic chutzpah. Strategic chutzpah. Yeah. You don't want to just... Uh, chutzpah everywhere. <laughs> chutzpah everywhere. Just focus in on like who you think is closest to what you want to do. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being a guest on oh, the show. I loved it. I could, I could just, I could sit with you for hours. I don't know if you noticed, but I handcuffed you to the chair. So we're <laughs> going to be here for another 90 minutes. Now, um, just a huge set of gratitude. Thank you for putting out the art into the world that you put out. Uh, I want to acknowledge the impact that you've had on millions of people, on me personally, and I know that what we just talked about will um, stir the hearts and minds of our watchers and listeners. So well, right back at you. You and I love listening to and or watching your show because it's, it's like inspiration in, uh, you know, in a bottle. It's lovely. Thanks, bud. Thanks. Appreciate you. All right, signing off. Super happy to have you on the show again. Thanks a thousand, among his other uh, five marvelous books. Check it out. Uh, and thanks for tuning in. See you again, probably.